Dear Sugar, life is hard. Sometimes I am blubberly. I'm watching a series on Hulu where the main character works through their personal life by writing for an advice column. People write into the column by saying, Dear Sugar, and anonymously spill out their griefs and struggles. God makes it in to much of the dear sugars, asking questions like, where is God? Why would God do this to me? Sugar is a middle-aged, middle-class mother of a teenager who often takes a while to respond to the questions with witty, insightful wisdom that keeps the column going. The ironic part is that sugar is a total disaster and in many ways in a midlife crisis. One parent wrote into the column telling the story of her newborn child who was going in for brain surgery. And the parent exclaimed, why God would let this happen? The parent also described all the people praying, but was unsure about the prayers and whether she actually believed in God. Sugar finally responded to this young mother and said this, what if we thought about God differently? and realize that God is not in the answers to our prayers, but in the people praying. The advice columnist Sugar reframed what prayer and God might mean to this parent with her baby. Sugar said, what if we form a raft that will hold our weight and keep us afloat by the human love given when we need it the most. That is where we see evidence of God's existence when life is turbulent. God is the people doing the good work. God is the people praying not necessarily in the prayers answered. Last week, some of you were here at this 9 a.m. service, and I began weeping. My nose was even dripping. I told my best friend, Beth, about this whole scenario, and she said, oh, you had a blubbery moment. Yep, I was blubbery. And when I uttered the words aloud during our prayer time, hold my daughter Nora in prayer, the floodgates were just open. My husband happened to be at that service, the first one since I started my ministry here, by the way. <laughs> I know, right? And later that day, he said, you are just so tired. He is right, I am tired. It has been quite a few m months of starting this job and moving, and at the same time, launching two young adults. I finally kicked them out of the house. <laughs> and, and just being in transition. When my mom sent me a text that my daughter was going to the hospital during the service, and then I got up and I spoke the words out loud to all of you, it just seemed that God might not have been answering that prayer, but at that moment, God showed up in the praying. Jesus was there. 
in my voice and all of you praying alongside me. God showed up in my shaky words. God showed up in your compassionate eyes. God showed up and the love was just too big for me to contain. So I got blubbery. <laughs> Which is very unusual, by the way. Even though week after week, about to make fun of myself here, I missed something in our prayer time together. I missed the response, God of compassion, hear our prayers. I miss the email that comes through on my phone, or I miss the last name of those I'm praying for, or I get blubbery. Always something is happening during those prayer times. Somehow our collective, beloved intention, that foundation of holding space to pray God does not come in our hopes for answered prayers in that moment, but simply is showing up, making home in the praying as a beloved, embodied community of God. It's more powerful than you can imagine. The words of the Gospel of John have a spiritual, poetic style of writing, asking us to believe in something we cannot see and profoundly difficult to understand. The words of Jesus in the Gospel of John are about believing in love, as Brooklyn taught our children, but more than that, about embodying this Love. The word love is hard to understand in English and can mean many different things. We kind of throw it around a lot in our American culture. Like, I love pizza and I love my grandma. Love for both of these things, though, doesn't mean the same thing. It might make our grandma feel bad. So in our scripture, we first come across love your neighbor phrase, which is a quotation from the Hebrew scriptures, where the word for love is ahava. But the language that Jesus spoke and taught in was a cousin language, Aramaic, in which the word for love is rakama. But when Jesus' followers spread his message worldwide, they translated it into Greek using the word agape. And here's what's fascinating. The early followers did not learn the meaning of agape by looking it up in dictionaries. They looked to the teachings of Jesus and the story of his life to re redefine the very concept of love. The word love is more about a model of caring for yourself and another. In other words, God might not show up in those answered prayers, but rather in the praying. God, God's love comes in the form of a verb rather than a noun. I often have a hard time grounding these poetic Johanian words in the reality of the 21st century. But the truth is, these early Jesus stories and ancient Jesus followers lived in turbulent times and experienced blubbery moments, just like we do. These John texts are tools for spiritual navigation when we experience these blubbery moments, when we are overwhelmed with tragedy and don't know what to do with systems of oppression and injustice, and everything just feels chaotic. There was another mass shooting in Texas yesterday, by the way. Jesus was locating the power of prayer and the power of faith in the community that he established that lives on today so that we might see God in the prayers of one another. 
What will it take to notice God in another? What will it take to know that prayer is more than empty words? What will it take to know that the beloved community Jesus left us with is an antidote to the blubbery moments of our world, the blubbery of our personal lives, and the blubbery of a broken society? Early in my ministry, I sat my three kids at the kitchen table, and we talked, well, I sat them down specifically to talk about their image of God. They were in primary school, by the way. This was probably the moment when they thought, this is what we get for having two parents as ministers. <laughs> to say the least, they were underwhelmed by this conversation. But I wanted to talk with them about God to ensure their progressive Christian education was working. You never really know. It was my little experiment, and my kids were the subjects. Did they feel connected and loved? Could they experience the way of Jesus? Would they be able to fight for justice and peace when life got blubbery? I wanted to make sure that there was an invitation to create an understanding of God that was unique to each of them so that they could navigate the waves of life. The foundation had been set. Now it was their turn to pull a little muscle in their faith. I believe that is what Jesus was doing on this day in this text. He had set the foundation and strength to build the beloved community. He was saying, now it's your turn, followers. One of my children answered the question about the image of God and said, God is the earth. Another said, God is love with a capital L. And the third one, the littlest, said, God is a mom hug. Her image came as a simple action. God showed up in the praying, not the answered prayers. A mom hug prayer. My kids are now grown teenagers and young adults. And my hope is not that they so much believe in God. That seems a lot to ask of adolescents, even ones that grew up with two ministers. But my hope, like the Johanian writers, is that they have some inkling of an idea that there is a love that is bigger and more gracious than they can imagine and that they can access that love in blubbery moments, massive injustices, crises, and chaos, and that that love will allow them to pause and see the way through. I believe that this is what Jesus wanted for the disciples in this text. He wanted them to have the spiritual audacity and the practical means to turn blubbery energy into their purposes to continue to spread goodness and create a movement solely based on love. Otis Moss III, UCC minister and black theologian, says that spiritual audacity refers to drawing on inner resources such as courage, and faith, self-love, prayer, meditation, or compassion in the belief that we are designed with purpose and agency to shift small elements in our control that may result in larger changes. Don't you wish that was like on a screen so you could read that again? <laughs> Jesus knew he was leaving and gifted the followers with a practice of believing in a love that would show up in each of them. I wonder if this image of God 
showing up in all of us can lend us those gifts of compassion and non-judgment? Could this image keep us from the crutch of despair that life often throws us so that we could fully live into our creativity and authenticity, purpose and vision, even belonging, knowing that we will be able to recognize God in the person sitting right next to you, the child on the chancel and the guests at our communion table. Last week in my blubbery moment of powerlessness, you and your prayers held me. This is the gift of faith. This is the way, the truth, and the life Jesus speaks of. Amen.